Now, our next speaker was on the faculty at MIT for more than 40 years before retiring and helping found Magna Motion Incorporated. He's worked on maglev and linear motor development since 1968, including work on high-speed electrodynamic systems and electromagnetic systems with a focus on long-stator linear synchronous motor propulsion. Richard Thornton joins us from Massachusetts. Richard, welcome to our Global Spec Automotive and Transportation Technology event. We appreciate you being with us today. Thank you, Jim. Today I'd like to talk to you about urban maglev and how it can be used to increase the speed of transit. You've heard a lot about high-speed trains and how they can be used to increase the speed of inner-city travel. Well, it's just as important to use modern technology in the urban environment to increase the speed, then more people would use it, waste less wasted time, less energy consumption. That's the message today. And surprisingly, by increasing the speed of transit using maglev, we can actually decrease the cost. Sounds interesting. The Federal Transit Administration initiated the Urban Maglev Project uh, several years ago. The idea was to see whether we can improve transit using magnetic suspension. They set a specification of 100 miles an hour. Sounds fast, but if you want to keep compete with cars for commuting, that's the kind of speed you have to get. They wanted 0.16 g acceleration. That comes out 1.6 meters per second squared. They wanted to be able to turn on a 60-foot radius horizontal turn, and they wanted to carry up to 12,000 people per hour per direction. Those are reasonable specifications for the U.S. Uh, it doesn't mean that maglev can't do better. We can go three times that fast. We can carry three times that many people. But if you go faster and carry more people, it costs more money. The objective is to find a cost-effective design. Magnamotion has worked for several years with a permanent magnet maglev suspension. The idea is to use permanent magnets instead of electromagnets. And this has many, many advantages we'll see. It also uses the linear synchronous motor for propulsion. When you combine these two, the way you keep costs down is to use smaller vehicles. You've all seen fleets of buses where you'd have several buses in a row carrying people. You can carry a lot of people in individual buses that are not mechanically coupled. The same idea for guided transportation. Instead of having trains that are mechanically coupled, they're electronically coupled. So you can get the same capacity. Why do you use small vehicles? Many reasons. Uh, it's going to lead to lighter weight guideways, we'll see. It's going to lead to more versatile control and higher, higher uh, load factor. One of the main efficiency problems with transit is that many hours of the day, the system is not fully utilized. You see long, empty trains chugging back and forth at high cost. We're talking about a system where we match supply to demand, where they're just like the airlines do. They achieve 85% load factor by matching supply to demand. And interestingly, the suspension we're talking about can be used for much higher speed maglev, and the propulsion we're talking about can be used for rail. So there are many advantages in what we're talking about today. Here's the key idea of magnetic suspension. You have a number of permanent magnets. In this case, it's just a sketch of a smaller version than an actual system. We have here four permanent magnets, north, south, north, south, north. Uh, and they're attracted to a steel rail, the suspension rail on the top. The suspension rail also has coils on it that provide the forces for propulsion. We put current in those coils, we control the current to create a force, and we can create a force that moves the vehicle back and forth. Now, permanent magnets by themselves are unstable. If you set a permanent magnet where the force exactly equals the, the, the weight of the vehicle, it would be unstable. If the gap got smaller, the vehicle would want to get closer. So we put control coils around the magnets and those stabilize the suspension. This is the key idea. Control coils around permanent magnets, but there's very little power in these coils. This is virtually a zero power suspension. The force is given by permanent magnets and they last essentially forever. Here's another view of it. Here's an undercarriage of a vehicle uh, where you see the permanent magnets in an array on the upper diagram there where this structure is a structure that is mounted on a vehicle undercarriage so it attracts upwards to steel rails that are on the guideway. The guideway consists of a concrete beam, a little like a monorail. The cross supports and then your, your stator for your linear motor, the steel rail for your maglev, is mounted to those steel rails and the permanent magnets on the vehicle are mounted below. 
with the control coils around them. This is the key idea. We choose this gap, it's about 20 millimeters between the stator and the magnets, uh, and in that gap we designed it so the weight of the vehicle just equals the force of the magnets. You'll notice also that they're offset magnets, some magnets a little bit one side of the other. By controlling those, we can create lateral forces for damping. So we get everything we want in this one suspension. We get suspension, propulsion, guidance, and damping. It's a very simple, it's much lighter than the kind of undercarriage you would have for a steel wheel on steel rail system. And it's a lot like a monorail, which has become very popular recently. A lot of foreign uh, cities like uh, Sao Paulo and Mumbai have been installing monorail because they like the idea of a relatively small concrete beam support structure. To test this idea, we built a test facility and we're going to show you the actual operation of a vehicle on this test facility. FTA has provided par partial support for us to construct this. We have a 160 foot test track. You see a picture on the right here of what it looks like. Uh, and what you'll see on there is the undercarriage for one segment of a vehicle. It would take one, two, three, four, however many of these as you wanted, depending upon the length of the vehicle. It's kind of like a bogey on a train, but it's, there's nothing mechanical moving about. There's no pivoting motion. It's a perfectly static system. Uh, we're also in the process of building a longer track down at Old Dominion University. At this point, I think I'll ask my colleague Tr Tracy Clark, who's been working with me for many years, first at MIT and now at MagnaMotion, developing a maglev and linear motor system. Tracy will demonstrate the operation of our test system. You take it away, Tracy. Thanks, Dick. Let's take a look at a few of the key features of this maglev technology here on our demonstration system in the laboratory. As you mentioned, it's an EMS-type maglev system, which means that we have permanent magnets mounted on the underbelly of the vehicle, which are attracted upwards towards a steel rail, which runs along the length of the guideway. These lift mechanisms are located on both sides of the vehicle. Uh, this lift mechanism not only supports the vehicle in the presence of gravity, it also causes the vehicle to follow curves in the guideway or uh, reject disturbances from side forces like wind loads and so forth. At the moment, the vehicle is at rest on the guideway, and because the vehicle weighs four and a half metric tons, I'm unable to disturb it in any way. However, we can command the vehicle to levitate. The vehicle lifts itself from its resting position and is now being suspended entirely by magnetic fields. There's no longer any physical contact between the vehicle and the guideway. And as such, I can apply uh, disturbance forces to the system. So I can apply a lateral yaw disturbance, or perhaps a lateral swaying disturbance. And you can see that the vehicle does respond to these disturbances. However, it does it in a well-damped, well-behaved man manner like a good suspension should. Let's cycle through a few park and levitation cycles so that we can see this operation in action. First, we'll command the vehicle to park again. And the vehicle is once again at rest on the guideway and can't be moved easily. We'll tell the vehicle to relevitate. And the vehicle once again lifts itself away from the guideway and is suspended entirely by the magnetic fields. Once we're levitated, we can command the vehicle to move. We generate forces to propel the vehicle with an interaction between the magnetic field from the magnets on the vehicle and the coils that we have embedded in the guideway. By driving currents in these coils, we can produce forces to either accelerate or decelerate the vehicle and cause it to move where we want it to go. First, we'll show a relatively slow move along the length of the guideway. We're commanding a, a speed of two meters per second and commanding the vehicle to move to the far end of the guideway. While the vehicle is moving, you'll notice that it maintains a very smooth ride quality and it's also very quiet in operation as opposed to, for instance, a steel wheel on steel rail transit vehicle. Even when traversing a joint, a thermal expansion joint in the guideway, the vehicle maintains a smooth operation as it travels. Next, we'll do a move at a bit higher speed. Uh, the fastest speed which we can safely travel on this limited 160-foot segment of track in our indoor section is five meters per second, or about 10 miles an hour. And you can see the vehicle moving at that speed. Once again, it's very quiet and has a very smooth ride quality. It accelerates, travels at five meters per second, and decelerates to a safe stop at its intended location. That's all the things we wanted to show in the lab, Dick. Let's go back to you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, the 
system at Old Dominion University, where we're now in the process of constructing our maglev system, is an elevated guideway that exists. It was built for former maglev system that never worked because the vehicle was too heavy. But with our lightweight vehicles, uh, we expect no problem. In fact, the beam that we put in the test facility is an exact replica of the beams that are at Old Dominion University. The advantage of this test facility, we'll have a longer track, we can go higher speed, it's outdoors, we can answer the question about snow and rain and ice and all of those things. So that's on our agenda. Now you might ask, what is the actual vehicle going to look like? What you saw Tracy demonstrate was the undercarriage for one part of a vehicle. Here's how we envision lightweight vehicles. They can be any length. We can be two of those pods you saw with an articulated middle. We keep it articulated so we can turn a sharp radius turn. We can put two of them. Uh, this might be what you'd use for competition with, say, a light rail system where you carry 60 people. We can carry 80. We can add more sections. If you want to go faster, if you want higher capacity, you use a longer vehicle. The key to cost-effective transit is matching supply to demand, never mind having largely empty vehicles shuttling back and forth all hours of the day and night. So on a versatile, lightweight vehicle, and the good news is that these vehicles are lighter than a conventional rail vehicle. The reason is the steel wheels are heavy, the bogies are heavy. Typically, those vehicles are made with steel or aluminum, not composites that we'll be using. Um, you might say, why is weight so important? Well, it turns out that most of the power loss you have is associated not with pushing air out of the way, aerodynamic drag, it's concerned with accelerating and braking, accelerating and braking over and over again, the way transit vehicles do. The lighter weight vehicle pays for itself. Any added cost of reducing weight is going to pay for itself and reduce energy consumption. Now I want to talk about a linear synchronous motor in a little more detail. Tracy showed you the operation, but let's go in a little more depth about how this works. I have here a simulation on the right we have permanent magnets on the top. This is upside down from what Tracy showed you, but it's the way most of our factory automation linear motors work. Uh, we have a seal lamination here, and we have coils. And the coils have current in them, and the polarity of the current is color-coded. Red is one polarity, blue is the opposite, and the intensity of the color is the magnitude of the current. So we can simulate the operation. As we change the currents in these coils, we create a force on the magnets. We can make the magnets move, or Alternatively, if the magnets are moving, we can control the current in such a way as it breaks. We can regenerate power. And this is very important in maglev. When the, we do a lot of braking in urban maglev, and every time we break, we regenerate energy, put it back in the system that some other vehicle can use. All right, let me put the simulation here. Now the currents are changing. We're creating propulsion. The magnets are moving. And that we have demonstrated the operation of the motor. See how that works? Red turning to blue, or turning to red, and the motion. It's either a motor or a generator. One of the key things is that our motor can be designed for very high efficiency. Some linear synchronous motors are not. They have very long windings, maybe a kilometer long, whereas uh, we have a winding that's only a little bit longer than the vehicle. In fact, it may be less than one vehicle long, and we have multiple blocks. We call that sub-block switching, but that's just jargon for saying we only excite a piece of the motor underneath the vehicle. We can get very high efficiency. And by the way, the important thing on efficiency is not the efficiency of the motor, it's the efficiency of the system. We have lightweight vehicles. That makes for our efficiency. We have streamlined vehicles. So when they're going fast, that makes for efficiency. Uh, all of those things count. So whether the motor efficiency is 80 or 85% is much less important than some of these other parameters. But in fact, we do get 85% efficiency with our linear synchronous motor. Another advantage, there are many advantages. One advantage is we have very precise position sensing. We do not depend upon friction for force, so we can operate with very short headway, several seconds. You might see buses on the highway operating with only five seconds between them, and that's our plan for the maglev, five, six, seven. This is a parameter, depends how fast you're going, of course. But because we don't depend upon safety critical communication, all of the control system is in the guideway. The vehicle is almost a passive vehicle from the point of view of the propulsion system. Oh, sure, there's going to be communication to people in the vehicle. If somebody in the vehicle is sick, he can communicate that. But we don't depend upon communication for safety-critical information. That's what helps with short headway. So 
We have an advantage that we don't have to transfer power to the vehicle. It's not safety critical. It can be high efficiency. You've got all of the parameters you want. It's been thoroughly tested. It speeds over 300 miles an hour in Japan. We know it works. It's been tested at over 260 miles an hour in Germany. There's no question that the long stator linear synchronous motor is a very viable system. Now, in order to reduce cost, I've talked about the idea of small vehicles. The idea is that if you have small vehicles and you only have one vehicle on a beam at a time, then the beam can be lighter and cheaper. Not only that, in off-peak times, like late at night, you, you, you operate just one small vehicle every three or four minutes instead of a big train every hour. It's much more efficient use of facilities. And by clustering the vehicles, meaning several small vehicles close together, uh, and they operate very much like a fleet of buses might that, that start and stop together. So it's like a train, but they're not mechanically coupled. By having small vehicles, it also facilitates regenerative braking. It's very easy to find something to do with the energy when you brake a vehicle. There's some vehicle nearby that can use that energy. Well, at this point, I'd like to demonstrate an actual operation of a linear synchronous motor, and my colleague Brian Perot is in the lab. And Brian, would you demonstrate the linear synchronous motor? Sure, Dick. This is our Magnum Mover light system. It's the smallest of our linear motor propulsion systems. One of the advantages of using linear motor propulsion is that the vehicles can be very simple. In this case, the vehicle is made up of some permanent magnets, some steel, and in this case, a little bit of plastic. All the intelligence is within the motor itself. Inside, we have a set of sensors, and we have a set of coils that we drive current through. When we drive current through the coils, it applies a force to the vehicle that allows us to control it. Systems like this are typically used for moving vials of blood around for testing or for assembling cell phones or other projects of that nature. Today, we've got the system set up to emulate a larger maglev system. So picture each of these little pucks as a larger maglev vehicle. We're operating them in kind of a virtual train here. The reason why we do this is number one, by having lighter vehicles, you can have a much lighter, less expensive guideway. Also, you can change the number of vehicles in your train here. At night, when there's little demand, you can run single vehicle consists and still have short waiting times for customers. During the day, at rush hour, you can have five vehicles in a consist and achieve much higher throughputs. Right now, we have two clusters of three vehicles moving between two stations. And what I'm going to show you in a moment is some of the strategies we can use to improve performance on top of this. So, Lisa? What you're going to see is that some of these vehicles are going to skip stations. So in this case, you're going to see the lead vehicle here join this consist and not stop at that station. That gains you a number of benefits. First of all, it means shorter transit time for the person on that vehicle going between stations. Number two, you can get higher throughputs with the same number of vehicles. So you can either have fewer vehicles in the system or gain higher throughput with the same system. That's about it. Back to you, Dick. Brian showed you a simple clustering scheme. Let me show you a 3D rendition of a much more complicated system. What I've got here is a system simulated in three dimensions using MATLAB that is scaled down in distance and speed to be able to see what's really working. If it was in real, real scale, of course, you, the vehicles would be insignificant compared to the distances they're moving. But if you, except for the issue of scale, this is how clustering and station skipping works. Look, you see the color-coded system. Each cluster has a different color. There's several vehicles in each cluster. It may look chaotic to you, but what we're doing is we're servicing every pair of stations in this system. Every vehicle stops, two stops between the start and the end, but they skip four stops. So only one-third of the stops that you would normally have in a transit system. If you can decrease the number of stops, you decrease the energy loss, you match supply to demand. And of course, if some pairs of stations require a lot of people, sure, we'll put two or three vehicles to service that load. And if one pair of stations has nobody, we won't bother to service that load. We can adapt supply to demand. In fact, off-peak, we would use the kind of philosophy that they use in Morgantown, West Virginia, where we base it on demand. If a person wants to go somewhere, he signals where he wants to go, and we adapt on the spot to the system to where this person wants to go. Well, you've seen a 3D rendition of how complex station skipping might work. Let me try and depict it in a little more graphic way. What I've shown in this slide is a plot 
of the distance versus time for multiple vehicles. This system that you see here consists of two clusters of three vehicles each. In other words, six vehicles operating in unison with the station systeming strategy. There are four intermediate stops. Each vehicle makes two stops and skips two stops. But every station pair is serviced. The average waiting time is only about a minute and that the average speed is over 60 miles an hour with the maglev system we're talking about. This is dramatically higher. For example, typical rapid transit systems operate around 30, 30 miles an hour average, maybe 35 of the best. Light rail operates around 20 miles an hour average. We're talking average speeds on the order of 60 miles an hour uh, because of a combination of high speed, fast acceleration, and station stopping strategy. We can do even more than that. We can have many more stops. And here's a more complicated system you might use for commuter rail where we have, uh, we can service 40, 41 or 45 station pairs in this example with four clusters of two vehicles, each making two stops. There are any number of applications. The secret to this is you do a, a lot of computation to figure out how to sequence the stops so they don't get in the way of each other. And it's, what you really see is clusters merging and forming as you dynamically as you go, and as you may have determined from that previous demonstration that Brian showed you. So we now have the combination of a linear synchronous motor allows shorter headway, it allows clusters, and moreover, groups of clusters to give you station skipping. Now we really can match supply to demand. We're talking load factors over 50% instead of 25 or 30%. We're talking higher speeds so more people use the system. Well, you might say, well, higher speeds can be more energy intensity. Well, not so. The reason is that we've addressed this issue. Here's some data on the energy intensity. I've taken this from reliable sources. I've taken it from the National Transit Database, from the um, uh, Transportation Energy Data Book. Uh, these are published data that you can access online. A city bus, median for the United States, takes about 508 watt hours per passenger mile. In other words, it's about a half a kilowatt hour per passenger mile. Well, you figure kilowatt hour costs at least 10 cents. So you're, you're talking about five, six cents worth of electricity for every mile that every passenger goes. It's a fair amount of power. It may, may be more efficient than a big heavy SUV carrying one person, but it's not efficient the way we want to be. Light rail is a little better, but not a lot better. Some people think that rail is very efficient. Well, it could be. Light rail could be efficient, but they run with low load factors. The median in this country is down around 25, 30 percent. So they throw away most of that efficiency. Most of the time, they're just hauling around steel, not people. Rapid transit, that's a little better. They're down to 350 watt hours. Commercial aviation actually is extremely good for the higher speed, longer distance. The reason is they fly at higher elevation. They can go four times as fast for the same aerodynamic drag. So aviation can be efficient. It wouldn't be efficient for short trips, but it is efficient for high, long trips. Um, Commuter rail is actually fairly efficient, but even that has a big chance for improvement. You might say, what is the best system you know? Well, the best system today is a modern, efficient electric car. Believe it or not, the plug-in Prius hybrid in all-electric mode beats almost anything you can think of. That's the competition. Um, 146 watt-hours per mile if you have 1.59 passengers. Now, that's a weird number of passengers, but that's the average for the U.S. In the United States, when they compute energy intensity of automobiles, they assume 1.59 passengers per car because that's the average that they have determined. So you're down around a seventh of a kilowatt hour. You're down around a couple of cents worth of electricity for every mile you go in a plug-in hybrid electric car in the electric mode. In the gasoline mode, it's a little more. It's up around 200. Now, we think Urban Maglev, we've done fairly detailed simulations. We're around 200. We think we maybe can do better. We're working. It depends upon how good the vehicle can be, how light can be, aerodynamic drag, how much onboard power do you have for the heating, ventilation systems. Um, but we're certainly very, very competitive with every other system. So, and we're going 100 miles an hour. The combination of efficiency, station skipping, and so forth allows Urban Maglev to be very efficient. We don't have any doubt that we can be one of the most efficient. But you know, it's interesting, we can also take our linear motor 
and apply it to wheelbase systems like New York City subway systems, we're actually looking into the possibility of linear synchronous motors adapted to propelling subway vehicles uh, and getting the same advantages of station skipping and matching supply to demand and so forth. Well, I'd like to summarize. What I've talked about today is permanent magnet maglev and LSM propulsion, quiet, efficient, and affordable. We've done fairly detailed cost analysis. We know that we can build an urban maglev system for less money than it costs to build a comparable light rail system. Sure, if you build a light rail system on an existing track, that's going to be less expensive. But if you're installing a new system on an elevated guideway, our system is less expensive. We operate small vehicles and clusters to increase the load factor. And the same maglev design can be used at higher speeds. If this system works and you like it, well, we'll use longer vehicles and we'll connect you between Boston and New York. We don't have to be restricted to Boston to the suburbs. And the same LSM design can propel rail vehicles. In short, maglev can reduce travel time, energy consumption, noise, cost, all of those good things. Thank you. Back to you, Jim. Well, thank you, Richard. You certainly have some exciting technology at Magnamotion, and we have some attendees with some questions, so let's get to them. This first one asks, can LSM propulsion be used for rapid transit? Yes, it can. I alluded to that. Uh, we actually have a beginning of a project. We're talking to people in the cities and the Federal Transit Administration about looking into that. Uh, not only can we use LSM propelling vehicles for rapid transit like New York subways, but at the same time we do that, we automate it. Now all of the major transit systems like uh, California, BART system, New York City subway, Chicago, all are looking into automating the system to save money, reducing labor costs. And as soon as you automate, that's when you want to look at the idea of using uh, station skipping and uh, small vehicles because now the cost of the operator is not important. The reason long trains were developed was so you had fewer people running it. You could have one or two people running a long train and make a lot of money, but if you don't have any people, there's no advantage in using a long train. Uh, but it's also interesting, we could also replace the New York subway with maglev. We could build much smaller beams, we mount them directly on the ties, we use the same electric DC power distribution system, use the same stations, um, and we, we hope to do a study in which we compare both uh, maglev and linear motor propelled steel wheel systems for uh, rapid transit subway. This is a case where you want extremely high capacity, up around 30, 40, 50,000 people per hour, where the cost of operating is extremely high, where you have huge energy costs, where we might be able to make a major advantage. All right, our next one says, I know you covered urban maglev in your presentation. Is it extendable to higher speeds? Yes, it is. Uh, our design was developed at 100 miles an hour. It's an interesting reason. Uh, the Federal Railway Administration said, we'll do everything over 100 miles an hour, and the Federal Transit Administration said, we'll do everything under 100. It was just an arbitrary line that they drew. Uh, the, we have very carefully designed our system so it could go much faster. We don't know how much faster. Uh, you would have to make some changes. Your beams need to be a little stiffer so you get better ride quality. We need higher power inverters. Uh, the cost per mile might be a little bit higher, but we think we'd be much less expensive than ex comparable high-speed systems, including high-speed rail. We think we're competitive with high-speed rail because with high acceleration, we can use the same guideway that the, the trains use. You take, take the proposal to put high-speed trains in California, they have to create a lot of new right away because trains can't accelerate fast in order to do make turns, they have to have a very large radius of curvature. We don't require that. We could go right over top of existing rail lines, allow the rail lines to be used for freight, and we just use the same right away. So there are many advantages, uh, and we think eventually uh, urban maglev will migrate up to higher speeds. Okay, next we have, a number of governors have refused funding for high-speed rail. Should they accept funding for fast transit? I think so because the reason they rejected it, for example, in Florida was it was a proposal for a system of 80-some miles. Uh, even the Europeans are very strong advocates of high-speed rail will tell you that high-speed rail is really only usable from about 100 miles an hour to about 500. 
Below 100 miles an hour, people are going to drive. The, 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 there's just no advantage, no matter how fast you go. Above 500, they're going to fly. Well, in Europe, they have a lot of city pairs that are connected, like Barcelona to Madrid. It's comparable to New York. Uh, it's comparable to San Francisco to LA, and a lot of people travel, and they can do it in two hours and 40 minutes by high-speed train. Well, we have only a few places in the country where we have that kind of situation. The Northeast Corridor, uh, the Northwest Corridor, there may be two or three. However, fast transit, that's everywhere. We're now spending $50 billion a year, more than $50 billion, on transit. And the interesting thing is that more than three-fourths of that is paid by subsidies, taxes on real estate and income, you name it, fees on parking, everything. That uh, transit is very expensive. Uh, there have been a lot of complaints lately in Boston, I know, about uh, transit and how costly it is. If we can go faster and attract more people, we have more fair revenue. And if we can reduce operating costs by automation, we have less cost. So the bottom line is you invest in fast transit, you save money, you reduce the subsidy, whereas if you invest in high-speed rail, you're very likely to increase the subsidy you need. All right, Richard, let me read this next one. It seems that maglev is a great idea, faster, safer, quieter, and lower energy intensity. It seems, however, that most countries and cities, et cetera, choose to go the route of more traditional railways. Is that correct? And if so, why? Uh, if you were planning a transition of a city, you would insist that the system be proven and tested and thoroughly, and, and, and thoroughly tested. In fact, usually the first thing you do is you hire a consultant. Now, the consultant's concerned about his own future, so the first thing he writes in this, his statement of work is that the system must have been proven in five years of existing operations. So on day one, you rule out any new system. Now, in Japan and in Korea and in Germany and Japan, the government has been willing to fund the development of maglev to the point that people are willing to install it. What we need is sufficient funds where we can test maglev, prove it, so there's no risk where the cities who are making these decisions can do it. The other is there's, there, are, there is an, an inertia. The, the suppliers of rail equipment have been strong advocates of rail and they've been strong critics of maglev. They will tell you that maglev is expensive and maglev is this and maglev is that. First of all, they don't understand that maglev isn't a static thing. It's been changing. There are newer designs that are much better. And secondly, uh, there are not many companies that want to risk a profitable business to go out for something that's more speculative. So the, the existing companies in the field will not support it. And this has been proven uh, in the case of uh, an award for a transit system between Oakland Airport and the Coliseum BART station. They elected to go with a cable car, if you can believe it. Um, and they ruled out maglev because it hadn't been proven. In fact, they ruled out monorail because it was a single source. So that, you know, if you have to have a system that's proven before anybody's can install it. And I believe that once we've proven the system, the system will sell itself. All right, we need to wind things up. Richard Thornton, thank you so much for taking the time to answer a few of our questions. We appreciate your sharing your knowledge of maglev with our attendees. Thank you for inviting me, Jim. I enjoyed the chance to explain the advantages of maglev, and I look forward to working with you in the future.